Welcome to Celebrate Michigan. I'm Christy Derry. And I'm Kevin King. Joining us today are some very special guests. They have founded a program to help keep your pets when you're unemployed. She is a graduate of Madonna University and has dedicated herself to help people and animals. She founded Basil's Buddies as an animal welfare group that would help both pets and their people. She also runs the animal hospice portion of the group, providing a loving, peaceful home to terminally ill animals during their final days. We would like to welcome Patty Rat Radakovich to Celebrate Michigan. And also joining us is Vice Chairman and Co-Founder of Basil's Buddies, Julia Funds. And next to Julia is the Medical Director and a Board Member for Basil's Buddies, Dr. Lucretia Greer. Welcome to Celebrate Michigan, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us, tell us about what is Basil's Buddies? What Basil's Buddies is, is an animal welfare organization. And we have a rescue portion of that group, but we try to really keep people with their pets. So the reason we say we're animal welfare instead of animal rescue is we try to make sure we have services um, to provide services for people so they can keep their pets um, and also help animals to get better quality care. So we do low-cost vaccine clinics, pet food banks, and then also the rescue portion of the group. Uh, how did it get started? How did you decide to start this organization? Well, Basil's Buddy started, Julia and I actually met um, mm -hmm. over 10 years ago. We, we were involved in another rescue organization on a board. Mm -hmm. And that was our first, um, well, not really our first exposure to rescue, but first exposure to it at the board level. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, more time as more time passed with that group, we realized that we had a philosophical difference from what the group was. They were not a no-kill group, mm -hmm. and we really wanted to be a no-kill rescue that valued all of the lives, not just look at the monetary um, implications of care for some of the animals. Mm -hmm. So after we were with that group for some time, um, we took you know, took some time off and had talked about developing this group. And about ten years later, we got together and decided it's time. <laughs> we're going to do it. And then we have our secret weapon, our super vet, <laughs> Dr. Greer, uh -huh. <laughs> um, that helps us with, with the medical care for the animals. Now, what kind of animals are we talking? Are we, I know we, we have cats here, but dogs or? And we do um, basically companion animals, so it's dogs and cats. We okay. work out of foster homes, so whatever we have the room for at that time. Um, but we've also done rabbits, um, and then I do chinchillas. So oh if there's something that exotic that comes through, if we have somebody who's qualified to handle that and it's something that we understand enough about to be able to do a good adoption at the end of it, mm -hmm. then we'll, we can possibly take those animals into the group. But it's mainly domesticated uh, companion animals. Now, what are some of the programs that you offer? The programs that we offer mainly are uh, adoption and rescue, the pet food bank, and then the low-cost vaccine clinic at this time. So with the rescue portion, we focus on the medical rescues, emergency rescues, and seniors. Um, for, so for the adoption part of it, you know, we fix them up and then we adopt them back out. Mm -hmm. um, the low-cost vaccine clinics are open to the public, and those are anybody can come in if they need to get their pets vaccinated or they need heartworm testing or heartworm medication, we provide that to them. And then we also have a pet food bank for unemployed and underemployed people. They do have to qualify for that. Um, they can come in and get food every month and then with that we do ask people who are able to actually volunteer back with our organization as a you know as a way for us to give them the food for us to keep running because we do run on volunteers okay wow. and then we also offer hospice as well for the terminally ill animals that come into our group um, we do the hospice uh, portion for that so that they can live out their days in a loving environment what's been the response to the programs that you offer from people who bring in their their animals to you um, we've had a really great response um, so far, especially the food bank. When we open up the pet food bank, we're located primarily in the Down River area right now. Um, you know, we are looking to expand eventually. Uh, so we have had a lot of people that came in uh, that really needed pet food. It wasn't a service that was provided. And then the low-cost vaccine clinics, we do rotate around the, um, around the Tri-County area. And that one, we've had a pretty good response to that as well because the, our vaccines are pretty much half the price of what you would get at a regular veterinary office. Now with the unemployment rate so high in Michigan, I know a lot of times when people lose their jobs, a lot of times they, they, the animals are the first to go. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to lean on you has, has got to be a, a huge benefit to them. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's part of the, you know, that's the reason why we developed these programs like the food bank is because we didn't want people to have to choose between feeding their animals and feeding their kids. And animals right. are yeah. part of the family. and. It's a, it's a big enough loss that they've lost their jobs or they've had to cut back on how they live right. and we don't want them to have to give up their animals too. So we want to be able to be there for them and help keep the whole family together. Mm -hmm. And what are some events that you have to help raise money? Because this is not, it's a nonprofit organization. It's a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. 
<laughs> the events that we do typical adoptions. So with the adoptions, um, just like most groups with adoptions, it's it's not a money making thing. People think you make money on adoptions, <laughs> and you you don't. You're just trying to recoup some of the uh, medical expenses that you put into your animals. And what we do for fundraisers, uh, a lot of it falls around the holidays. So we might do craft shows at, at various places. Um, we also work with local pet smarts. They have a Santa Paws photos where you can come in and bring your pet in and get your pet's picture taken with um, Santa. Okay. <laughs> so okay. that's one of our big fundraisers that always happens in December. Mm -hmm. And everybody can just go to our website, and that's all of our events are listed on our website at www.basilsbuddies.org. Now, you all are doing great things for, for everyone. How does it make you feel when someone comes to you in need, you're able to help them out, and then you go home at night and, and kind of feel you know, good about yourself, that you, you provide a service that otherwise wouldn't be there for them? Well, for us, it's really about keeping people with their pets. So, I mean, we feel that we're providing a service that people need, and it you know it makes us feel good that we're able to do that. And we rely on the donations of other individuals. So, like with our food bank, whatever is donated in is what we give out. So, um, luckily, we have not you know we haven't run out of food or anything like that. We've had enough <laughs> donations to cover you know what we have, but it's really I mean it is a good feeling to be able to help people because a lot of times people just say. You know, they'll call us and say, I have to give up my pet. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we don't say, okay, let's go through the process. Why do you, you know, let's fill out the paperwork. We stop and say, well, why do you need to give up your pet? Let's okay. talk about it first. How can we help you to, so that you can keep your pet and mm -hmm. not have to give it up? Mm -hmm. And so that's the service that, that we like to be able to provide and make sure that they have a happy home and then, you know, the animal is well cared for and the people feel good too because they're able to keep their animal. We well, you know a lot of times, I'm sure, you know, people, who aren't really um, that you know caring or familiar with animals might say, oh, you, you know, you know, let the animals go. Um, can you talk about how really having a companionship or having an animal as a companion really can help with self-esteem and boost the families, uh, their their whatever they're going through at the time? Yeah, well, a lot of it is one is they've done studies, particularly with cats, to show that the senior citizens that have cats actually tend to live longer because mm -hmm. it's a stress oh. reducer. Mm -hmm. It's calming for them, and it actually makes them a little bit more active, so they have to do something. <laughs> but even with, with children, it, it teaches children responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, kids, uh, kids that have pets, they, you know, they seem to be, they're, they're happier because they, you know, they have animals, they learn how to take care of animals, they... There's just a lot that goes into it with them. Um, they're healthier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're healthier with kids. There was a study done that showed that kids that had pets tended to be um, much healthier than kids that don't really? have pets. Um, and along with the seniors, there's also programs for like aut autistic children mm -hmm. um, in terms of like therapy uh, with, with pets. And so there's, there's so much. Um, in terms of the emotional, the human-animal bond is is pretty amazing, and I don't think anyone should should pass on without experiencing it at some point. So, okay. all, right. all right, we're going to take a, a short break, but when we come back, we're going to talk more with Patty, Julia, and Dr. Greer on Basil's Buddies. Stay tuned. You're watching Celebrate Michigan. the tough classes now. You need them to prepare for college. So my uncle calls and he says he's dizzy and he's losing his balance. So I'm like, oh, you want me to take you to a doctor? He's like, no, I'm going to look up the symptoms. I said, your symptoms are you're dizzy and you're losing your balance. So he said, I can't get on the internet because my arm is numb. I said, well, use your good arm and dial 911. Stroke's no joke. If you or someone you love is showing symptoms of stroke, don't wait because it might be too late. Dial 911. Time lost is brain lost. Coming home can be hard if you're a veteran of Iraq or Afghanistan. You may feel like you're all alone, but you're not alone. At IAVA.org, your fellow vets are all around you.
Join our free online community, get the resources you need, and connect to other vets who know where you're coming from. IAVA.org. We've got your back. In the event of a car crash, three out of four kids are not as secure as they should be because their car seats are not used correctly. But the latch system makes it easier to get it right and to hold your kids tight. Anchor. Tether. Latch. Learn more at safercar.gov. Welcome back to Celebrate Michigan. We're talking with co-founders Pat, Patty Radovich and Julia Funds, along with medical director and board member Dr. Lucretia Greer about Basil's Buddies. So Basil's Buddies, how did that name come about? Because it doesn't have anything to do with dogs or cats. <laughs> Actually, it does have to do with a dog. Okay, um, <laughs> it was a dog in particular. Basil was the name of uh, one of my dogs. It was my first cancer dog, oh. and he passed away in 2006. So when I formed the group um, with Julia, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that he was incorporated in there somehow. And Aww. so it's Basil's buddies. That's sweet. All right, we've got some. We've got some buddies here. <laughs> yes, we do. Tell us a little bit about uh, the. We have three actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. We have right here, this is Justine. Justine is, this is an example of a typical cat that we would find in a shelter mm -hmm. um, that's available for adoption. And the, a couple of reasons why she's typical is one, she's black. There's a lot of black cats out there. Okay. Um, there are some, still some people that have superstitions about that, but black cats make loving companions just like everybody else. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, but she was also a teenage mother, which is a big problem with cats. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. She was just under a year old when she already had her first litter. So that's typical that you find in the shelter situation where you have these young cats that are having kittens of their own. And so we rescue them and get them fixed and then mm -hmm. put them up for adoption. So this is Justine. How, is there a limit to uh, you know, how many pets a family or person can bring in to you? Well, typically like what we take in is we take in as far as you're talking about to bring into our program to adapt yeah. out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, we go based on space. So okay. we do look at surrenders. We do uh, pull animals from shelters, but it's all we work out of foster homes, so it's based on what space is available in the foster home. And like I said before, is we try to work with people first to make sure that they, um, if we don't want them to give up their pet if they don't have to. So we try to work with them to make sure okay. if there's any way possible mm -hmm. they can keep their pet. So if it's mm -hmm. medical care that they need, food, um, we try to work with them to get them the services that they need. Dr. So. Beer, who's this little one we this have is here? Darla. Um, Darla's been with the group since she was about six weeks old, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, she has a congenital condition called spina bifida. Okay. Uh, basically what that is is the nerves and the bones that uh, make up the spinal column mm -hmm. um, don't fuse properly and it can happen along any segment uh, of the spinal column in cats. Most typically it occurs just before the hips okay. and that's where her problem is so she can't use her back legs at all. Um, she can't feel them either, but she, uh -huh. uh, I mean, I've, I've watched her grow. She was a small kitten, and I've watched her grow into this, to this beautiful kitten now. She's a, she's a cat. <laughs> she's and a she actually has, now. she has three legs. She has three legs. Um, one of her limbs when she was younger, uh, it, the joints kind of became a problem and locked out of place, and it made it very difficult for her to, to get around. So. Uh, we discussed it and decided that it was uh, a, a good decision to amputate the leg and now she just has the one that she can maneuver around maneuver mm -hmm. around well I can put her down here so you we'll yeah, see how, does she, how does she she's get very around? fast she scoops around <laughs> she is um, she's very quick cats typically do not need wheelchairs like you would see dogs in wheelchairs uh -huh. um, cats okay. don't she's, she's a little, a little she's a little scared Aww. right now but she just scoots herself around with she can actually climb up on things you'll, you'll find her sitting she's a, she's one of our sanctuary cats so she's going to be with us for the rest of her life okay. and you'll see her she's in a cage-free environment so she's not locked in a cage but you'll see her climbing up on things so yeah so so it she really you know it's just the um you know, like I said, just because she doesn't have the full use of her back legs doesn't mean that she's not mobile. She right. certainly is. She's a okay. beautiful face, too. Yeah, she and, is. And who do we have hiding <laughs> in this bag here? Oh, to get him out. That's Mr. Tanner. This is Tanner. <laughs> this is actually Justine's son. And he is an example of a kitten 
a re you know, regular kitten that we would rescue, but he's also one of our medical rescues, and Julia can tell you <laughs> about why he came into our group. Yeah, I pulled Tanner um, from the shelter because when he came in with his mom and his two other brothers, um, he had a really bad eye infection, and we thought he was going to lose his eye. It was so bad you couldn't see the actual eyeball itself. Wow. Um, and then he got a secondary bacterial infection on top of that. So I wanted to pull him because in the shelter, most city shelters don't have the means to get the medical care for the shelter. <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> honey. And so, so we pulled him, and he's all better now. He, um, his eye is a little droopy, but he can see out of it, and he's mm. the typical normal kitten, and he's making up for lost time. <laughs> oh, wow. That's wonderful. Yeah. So yeah, so these are examples of you know the adoptable animals that we do have, and like so this one is like a medical rescue that we can fix up that they wouldn't be able to do at the shelter, and then we can adopt them out. And we are you had asked about you know the spacing that we have. We're limited by the number of foster homes that we do have, so we're okay. always looking for new foster homes. There's a qualification process, um, but with foster homes, you know we provide everything that the person would need to, to care for either the dog or cat or whatever animal they'd be taking, okay. and then they just basically provide the home and the love for mm -hmm. the animal. Oh. Now, do, do, you know, when someone comes and wants to adopt a, an animal, do you find oftentimes they leave with more than one, or <laughs> they come in with a cat in mind, and they get sometimes. They take the cat and the dog? <laughs> sometimes they do. Um, it really depends, you know, what they're looking for. Like we have an adoption, uh, we have an adoption process, so there's an application that they that they fill out. Um, okay. We're different than a city shelter. At a city shelter. Um, they most of the time would have to adapt the animal out to anybody that walks in the doors. We're a okay. little bit more particular, so there's some screening processes that we do through, go through. There's qualifications um, that people for have to For example, meet. like what? Oh, well, for example, like one of the things is, uh, you know, we look to see if they have any current animals in the home. Um, we want to make sure that they're not over their city limit. Each uh, city okay. has their own limits, so we need to make sure that they're not... Um, if they can only have three cats and they're trying to adopt two more, we can't do that. Gotcha. Um, okay. Also, if there's breed-specific legislation in their city, like we have a lot of pit, mi pit mixes that have come through our group, we can't adopt a pit out to certain cities. Mm. Um, okay. mm. But also we're looking to see if they have animals, you know, if they provide the proper vet care um, and make sure if they have children, everybody meets the animals before they adopt it. So we want to okay. make sure. We'll continue with, okay. uh, with more of the adoption <laughs> process. But we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk more with uh, Patty, Julia, and Dr. Greer and Basil's buddies. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. Sounds like you could use some Van Gogurt. It's fortified with arts-rich nutrients to improve your math and reading skills. Catch! Van Gogurt, thanks. So what's the deal with your ear? Always with the ear, huh? Feed your kids the arts. For 10 simple ways to learn how, visit americansforthearts.org. Yo, 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 check out this chef, right? <laughs> right? That's so gay. That's really gay. Dude, look at those pants. Please don't say that. What? Don't say that something is gay when you mean that something is dumb or stupid. It's insulting. It's like if I thought this pepper shaker was stupid and I said, man, and this pepper shaker is so 16-year-old boy with a cheesy mustache. Just saying. When you say that's so gay, do you realize what you say? Knock it off.
Welcome back to Celebrate Michigan. I'm Kevin King. I'm Christy Derry. We are talking with co-founders Patty Radikovich and Julia Funds, along with medical director and board member Dr. Lucretia Greer about Basil's Buddies. Now tell us, where are you located? Currently, we're located out of foster homes. That's okay. where we work. Is um, We don't have a physical facility. We're working towards a facility. Our long-range goal is actually to build a very large animal sanctuary here in southeast Michigan. We're trying okay. to uh, model ourselves after best friends in Utah. And so we're looking to get uh, we're looking to get land, but it's a step-by-step -step process. So we start offering these services, and we're looking for donors that can help us build, the, raise the capital fund to be able to get a building. And then the next step after that would to be purchase land for a sanctuary. Okay. So mm -hmm. if somebody is seeing the show and they want to get involved, they can go to your website, yes. basilsbuddies.org, yes. and get more information. Yes, all okay. of our information is on our website. Information on how to donate, you can donate directly on our website as well through PayPal. And what makes you guys so much different than an animal shelter? Well, we're different from an animal shelter. Animal shelters, there's different types of shelters. A city-run shelter, um, most of them are not no-kill shelters. So they are required by law. If an animal comes in, they have to take it. They hold it for a certain number of days. If they don't get adapted out, then they may euthanize those animals. Um, there's traditional rescue groups. Some of those are, are, are kill. Some of those are no-kill rescue groups as well, and they focus on you know, rescuing animals out of the shelters and getting those adapted out. Mm -hmm. The way that we're different is we do rescue as well, and we love rescue groups, and we work very well with, uh, with most of the rescue groups are around us. We have a lot of partnerships with them. Um, but we tried to fill a, a niche that wasn't offered, and one of the things we wanted to focus on was providing the services to people to help them keep their pets, to keep them out of the shelters in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and working with them to help with the spay neuter to you know make sure that the animals are fixed so that <coughs> you don't add to the overpopulation problem and then also focusing on the animals that other groups simply couldn't take because of the cost and those would be our medical rescues emergency rescues seniors because they require more care and then the sanctuary and hospice animals and part of the reason we're able to do that is because we have dr lucretia greer on our board and she does uh, integrative medical care so she does both eastern and western veterinary medicine and so we're okay. able to offer some remedies that are non-traditional and they work better and happen to be cheaper too so <laughs> <laughs> and she can tell you a little bit more about that yeah I, I do I practice integrative medicine and it's basically um, just a, a combination basically of, of the Eastern and Western um, I'm certified in, in uh, ac acupuncture oh, okay. um, and uh, <laughs> And herbal therapy, um, and I, I do um, you know help with with homeopathic remedies and, and things like that. Mostly uh, the Chinese herbals, the acupuncture uh, techniques, and um, ha have worked uh, wonderfully with a lot of the hospice animals, um, cancer patients that need you know symptomatic therapy. It's amazing what acupuncture can do to help a lot of those patients, um, al along with some some medical therapy. So. Uh, it's 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 exciting and it's it's great to be able to offer just a variety of different types of things based on the animals needs so now with the hospice um, the hospice animals that you have is there some kind of requirement that they have to meet in order to be accepted into your program it's, it's based on space Okay. And, you know, hospice, so it's, it's like the human hospice, but just for animals. So it's basically what we try first is we try to do what we can to, um, you know, to cure them of the condition. And if, if it's found that, you know, through all of the processes that we use that mm -hmm. it's, we're not able to do that, then we want to provide them supportive care and, and we want to make sure that they're comfortable, you know, through, through the remainder of their life. And so some of the animals, too, might be transfers from other groups or they could be um, a shelter has called us and say, hey, we have this animal and, and you know, maybe they don't want to euthanize it there and see if there's something we can do. So, you know, that's one of the ways we work with the other groups, too. Has there been an uh, experience in your life that has drawn you to this, this kind of work, whether as a child or as, a, as an adult that made you really want to offer these types of services? This is for any one of you. I mean, it, I mean, for all of us, I think it's different is that we all have a passion really for animals mm -hmm. okay. and that's what drives it. And, you know, for me personally, I've been volunteering my entire life and I, I'm an advocate for the underdog. And okay. you know, right now, <laughs> Literally. Like, <laughs> for, no me, pun intended, right? for me, yeah. as, a, as a veterinarian, I, I was a part of a, a very large practice and too far like so often we would see animals come in and, and they would be euthanized for conditions that that really could be treated and 
obviously when, when you're working for a corporation or a hospital, you're bound by what services you can right. do, you know, um, pro bono, if you will. And, uh, and it becomes, it's, it's heart-wrenching a lot of times. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I didn't sign up to euthanize everything that couldn't be treated, even though I know that there's a treatment option for them. So okay. mm -hmm. for me, uh, it's, it's a breath of fresh air to be a part of Basil's Buddies and be able to offer my services uh, for the group and, and help in this way. Uh, when a lot of, uh, in many circumstances, in a clinic situation, I can't, mm -hmm. you know, so. Um, it's and, and it's nice to also have a resource uh, because for a lot of clients that do come into the clinic, mm -hmm. I can pass them on to Patty and, and we can put them through the group and see if possibly we can help them that way. So it's, it's rewarding in a lot of in a lot of ways. And Julia, was there anything in particular in your life? That you no, remember? just always loved animals and always was the one to say, look what followed me home. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've always been in rescue ever since I started very young. Well, yeah. again, you know, we, we talk about <clears throat> a lot of people are unemployed nowadays. What advice would you give to someone who has a passion and a love for whatever it is that they, they love to actually go out there and, and do the types of things that you're doing? Do you mean specifically to start like a rescue organization? Yeah, or, or wh whatever their interest, entrepreneurial spirits yeah, take Yeah, I, I always tell people, you know, I mean, go do what you're passionate about because if you're in life, you want to be happy mm -hmm. and life is short. So... Do what you're passionate about, and if you don't know how to get started, just go out there and ask. I mean, you know, right. part of how we started with the group, like I said, we had worked with other rescues. We kind of saw how things worked, things we didn't like, and then really, it's you know, the internet is out there provides so much information. Mm -hmm. How do you know? How do I start a nonprofit? Mm -hmm. and well, I didn't can, know. I you googled can, it. You can go to basilsbuddies.org <laughs> yep. if you want to learn more about Basil. Thank you so much for being on a show. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you for uh, tuning in. We'll see you next time.